I think that a lot of teams have downsized their SDR team. That's a challenge. A lot of teams have also cut back resources, budget, in enablement as well. So like smaller, nimble team, less resources to like ramp, train, and support the team. So I think overall, sales teams are struggling, at least in the tech and SaaS space. And specifically, like a lot of sellers that maybe sort of came up into sales when times were good, they're sort of struggling the most, right? Folks that have maybe been around a little bit longer, have you know experienced some downturn markets and stuff like that, they know how to sort of navigate the waters, right? Welcome to Revenue Insights. Every week, we'll be joined by revenue leaders from some of the most successful and highest growing companies. Together, we explore how they built their revenue teams, the journeys that they've been on, and the lessons they have learned along the way. Revenue Insights is brought to you by Ebster. We're a revenue intelligence platform designed to help revenue teams to build more pipeline, close more deals, and retain more customers. Hello there. You are listening to Revenue Insights. Today, my guest is Colin Mitchell, managing partner at Leadium and host of the Sales Transformation Podcast. Colin, welcome. It's great to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Been looking forward to it. Likewise. It's been one in the making. It's been a while trying to get this one in, so really excited to dive into things a bit more. For everyone listening that hasn't come across your stuff, or some of you, I know you're very active on LinkedIn, got your own podcast. What's your story? How have you got to where you are today? Yeah, I mean, I can go way back, but I'll keep it brief so that we can get to some of the more interesting things that we've planned out for today. But I was raised by a single mom, grew up very poor, didn't go to college, wasn't the most responsible young adult, didn't really know what I was going to do with my life. Then I got my first sales job. And it was my way out of sort of poverty or living check to check as I sort of was at that time. And it was really the only opportunity I had. So I knew it was my way out. And I put everything into it. So what that looked like was being the first one to the office every day, being the last one to leave every day, coming in on Saturday, possibly Sunday to prepare for the following week, send out proposals. And it was really just grinding and putting in a lot of hard work. I didn't have any fancy education. I didn't have any experience, really. I just knew that I could work harder than most people. And I think it was just really because my determination to make something out of it. And so I worked my way up to the top there pretty quickly. Shortly after that, took a VP of sales position where I learned a little bit more business acumen, learned how to recruit, train, and manage people, things like that. And then after that, Ended up starting my first business with my wife, and we scaled that business from zero to five million in 26 months. And from there, started multiple other companies. I've had three exits, and then more recently joined Leadium now as their managing partner, where we help mostly B2B companies, mostly tech and SaaS, solve their top of funnel challenges through done for you outbound and inbound lead management. Beautiful. Let's start with that last bit then. In particular, what would you say are Or what would you say is the one perhaps biggest challenge that are facing your clients at the minute that you're commonly coming up against? I mean, it kind of varies and it depends on the stage of the company. I think that a lot of teams have downsized their SDR team. That's a challenge. A lot of teams have also cut back resources, budget, and enablement as well. So like, smaller, nimble team, less resources to like ramp, train and support the team. So I think overall, sales teams are struggling, at least in the tech and SaaS space. And specifically, like a lot of sellers that maybe sort of came up into sales when times were good, they're sort of struggling the most, right? Folks that have maybe been around a little bit longer, have you know experienced some downturn markets and stuff like that, they know how to sort of navigate the waters, right? But people that have only really been able to sell deals when times were good and budgets were easy to get approved, they're having a hard time. So I think the thing that customers are struggling with most right now is trying to figure out what the structure looks like. Do we go to a full cycle AE model? Do we still have an SDR function? Do we outsource it? Is it a combination of those two things? So a lot of changes being made and testing things and 
I think that's what I'm seeing a lot of right now. Just a quick reminder, and then we will be right back to the show. At Revenue Insights, our goal is to share how top performing revenue leaders build predictable, efficient, go to market teams. Every week, we speak to the brightest minds, and every quarter, we release the latest findings from our analysis of billions of dollars in pipeline. If you don't want to miss out, sign up to our newsletter at ebster.com forward slash newsletter dash sign up. That's ebster.com forward slash newsletter dash sign up. The link to make that a little bit easier for you will be in the show notes of this episode wherever you're listening. See you there. And I really want to dig into that a bit more, particularly on your point of the particularly smaller and more nimble teams. It's this switch that I know everyone's talking about on LinkedIn and in the industry as a whole around how can we be more efficient? How can we be more effective? How can we squeeze more out of what we've got at the minute, which is often much smaller? I'm curious to get your perspective on what you're seeing in terms of the folks that you're talking to and working with of, oh, should we be scaling back our SDR function? Should we have an SDR function? Should we have the full cycle sellers, like 360 sellers? What's your point of view? I think it depends. I think it depends on what you sell, how complex it is, what your sales cycle looks like. Maybe you have different segments and there may not be a one size fits all for every business line, right? So selling into SMBs and selling into enterprise, vastly different, right? Maybe in the SMB, full cycle works, right? Or maybe the opposite, maybe an enterprise full cycle works where it's like, hey, they don't have to source as many deals, they just need to source the right deals. But then there's the people that have the argument of like, hey, do you want your best people spending time on doing that or do you want them spending time with customers? So I think you got to look at your own organization and decide what, look at your data, look at your sales cycles, look at your win rates, look at where deals are dropping off and really analyze that. Not just, hey, what's our win rate, but like by segment, by seller, by team, by industry, by deal size, and really analyze all that to make good decisions. Because you can't just make hasty decisions without doing that. And you also don't want to just make some swift changes based on what other people are saying or talking about on LinkedIn or like you name it. I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but you'd be surprised. I've been in situations where people want to change things based on something people are talking about on LinkedIn. It's like a lot of times what people are talking about on LinkedIn does not have full context and also is not their experience may not be yours or So there's a lot of factors that you have to consider. So it's a hard question to answer because it highly depends. But I think the right answer is like, you really got to look at these things and analyze them to make good decisions, sound decisions for your business. Which leads perfectly on then. What, when you're doing that analysis and perhaps you're, depending on the size of the company, perhaps you're pulling on a sales op for a RevOps person to pull that data for you. Perhaps you've got a data analyst. When you've got that data in front of you, what are the factors that you are looking for? Would you be looking for in, if you were putting yourself in those shoes to really give you an indication of the direction to take? Yeah. I mean, I think the thing is, is you're looking at, you're looking at conversions at all stages, right? Whether that's from all the way from top of funnel of, hey, inbound lead, leads converting from MQLs to SQLs, from first meeting to second meeting, where are things dropping off? And then analyzing what is it costing, right? To get an account from, you know, a prospect from an MQL to an SQL. Because a lot of times I think what ends up happening, and this is kind of when we weren't in this sort of economic downturn and companies didn't have as as much difficulty raising money, when the landscape was vastly different, profitability was less important. It was just revenue at all costs, sell, sell, sell. And that's where you had a lot of like bloated teams. And then everybody was all upset because people were getting laid off left and right. And it was like, well, there was a lot of bad decisions being made based on this sort of revenue at all costs playbook that most tech and SaaS were operating off of. And now you see teams more concerned about profitability and things like that, which is interesting as if profitability was never important. (laughs) But you got to look at all of your conversion metrics from the top of the funnel to close. And then you got to even segment it down, right? So 
where are we disqualifying deals? How many, what percentage of deals are we disqualifying? What are the reasons we're disqualifying those deals? And then you got to look at conversions metrics. Okay, the deals that are not getting disqualified, are they getting from stage one to stage two? And this is assuming you have all this mapped out as you should. You have a bigger problem if you're just working off of like really simple meet disco demo. If you don't have good criteria, good exit criteria of like what gets a deal from stage one to stage two, then that's a bigger problem. But also full context highly depends on what you sell. If what you sell is very transactional, then you might have a more simple laid out sales process, less stages, simpler exit criteria, and things like that. So these are the things that you want to look at. All of these conversion metrics at every stage, and the data will start to tell you where you're having problems. The benefit of having this mapped out well too, is that you start to see where your team is struggling and what specific people are struggling and what area of your sales process. Beautiful. And I can almost like picture it as you talk through it. So let's say we've got this in front of us, we've got the full funnel, and we can see on from team to team or AE to AE, where those drop off points are that you referred to. And, and you started to allude to it there. And I, I want to dig into it a bit more of let's say, for example, we can see that there's a big drop off from when a deal enters like the prospecting stage for a certain AE. What does your, I guess, investigative process look like at that point when you can see, okay, there's a lot of deals that are dropping off here for this team compared to that team or for that rep compared to that rep? What are you doing at that stage to really investigate what we can do here to improve? I mean, there's a number of things, right? If you see that, hey, this particular SMB team that maybe works in this certain sector industry aren't getting very many deals from stage one to stage two. Well, you got to dig in a little deeper and start to analyze what's going on, right? And that could be digging into sales calls, talking to the frontline managers, talking to the reps, or all of the above. And maybe you see that, hey, that's not a good sector for us to focus on right now. And maybe there's a reason for that. The other thing is maybe SDR function in-house doesn't make sense. Maybe it's better to outsource that SDR function for that particular sector. Maybe it's better to have a full cycle AE manage that sector if it's a smaller portion of your business. So there's a lot of different possibilities, but you got to look at this data and then start to understand what's really going on. Beautiful. Let me take us in a slightly different direction and away from the point of tooling. When I was doing my research coming into this conversation, I was having a look through your LinkedIn and some of the stuff that you've been talking about. And one thing that stood out to me, you were talking about different perspectives on LinkedIn. And we've kind of covered it a little bit today as well, where it's very, or often a lot of the advice can be very subjective. And it's very much dependent on your business and the markets you target, so on and so forth. So what would you say is the advice that you see on LinkedIn that you hate the most? I hate when people say like, this is the number one thing, or this is the best way, or you should only do this, or you should never do that. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that I hate because it's so dependent on your situation. And here's an example that a lot of people will hate, right? Everybody knows predictable revenue, okay? The SDRAE function, like, how, you know, all of that, like, that's kind of where a lot of that started to get adopted, like post that, right? But full context, like that worked in the situation and scenario of him working at Salesforce. Not everybody is a Salesforce. So that function doesn't necessarily work for everybody. But it became widely popular, widely adopted, and frankly could have contributed to a lot of these like over bloated SDR teams that now when times got tough, thousands of people got laid off. So I think that you have to be careful of trusting what people say on LinkedIn. I've seen people get burnt so many times. Of People know what to say to get comments and engagement. But if you actually pull back the curtain a little bit, a lot of times it's not based on any real experience. A lot of times the people saying things have never really actually done much to be able to give it, be giving that sort of advice. Or you might not have full context or it may not be applicable to you. Like every situation for every company is different. There's obviously similarities and stuff like that here, but I think where people start to get into a little bit of trouble is thinking that there's like a one size fits all and there's just not. Yeah, it's looking for that silver bullet to come in and solve all of your problems, right? So let me ask what is definitely a loaded question. I know it. 
But is predictable revenue realistic in 2023? Yeah, look, I'm a fan of that model, but it doesn't work for everybody. And if you're a small Series A company trying to get to your next round of funding, you know, being more nimble and having full cycle, maybe full cycle, maybe outsourced SDR team and full cycle is a good option, right? If you're a massive company, like we have worked with companies all the way from early stage to large enterprises, like name brands, you know, household name brands that everybody knows. And you would think like they're so big, why wouldn't they just have their own internal SDR team? Well, because maybe those resources are better spent doing something else, right? If this is going into a new market, a new segment, or something that they've maybe struggled with, it could make sense to outsource. So I think you have to look at every situation and see what's right for you and not just do what used to work or what everybody else has always done or what worked for somebody else because it may not work for you. Appreciate that in every example, it's subjective. What have perhaps been three, I want to say, tactics or techniques that stand out to you that you that Ledium has been successful with in the past 12 months? I would say the number one thing that contributes to the success that we have, and we have an 87% win rate. Very few teams can say they have an 87% win rate. Mm, nice. And it's not because we're amazing or we're the best or we're closers, none of that, right? It's because we're diligent with our pipeline. We don't put a deal as an opportunity unless it is gone through rigorous qualification of like, hey, this is a deal that we want to win, right? Not everybody has the luxury of being able to pick and choose who they work with, but you should strive to get there. Because once you can get really good at qualifying and disqualifying deals, it could easily double or triple your win rate. Like it's very common in B2B tech and SaaS that like 20% is a great win rate. (laughs) I'm sure you've seen the data. And let's be honest. Let's be honest. My good friend, Andy Paul, talks about this a lot. He's got a newsletter and a podcast. I've, I've been on his show and he's really dedicating a lot of work and time and energy to helping, helping companies increase their win rate. So it's, got, it's something I've been a little bit obsessed with lately as well. But let's be honest, winning 20% of the time is laughable. That is not good. Yeah. I was actually trying to pull from our numbers from our, our benchmark report. I think the win rate last quarter on average, which is taken across all industries that we're looking at, was somewhere around about 28%. So it's the classic Pareto principle at work yet again. So I'm curious then, you mentioned about the diligence that, that you put into disqualifying deals. What does good qualification look like then? Good question. So good qualification is you first, you need to understand what good is. What is a great customer, right? And let's define what is a great customer. Well, it's somebody who you can help with whatever it is that you do. Let's say you do a service, tech, whatever. So you can solve the problem that they have. Well, one, the problem's got to exist. What is that problem? Can you quantify that problem? Do they value you solving that problem? And you can use whatever sales acronym that you want to do this, right? I'm not a fan of BANT. Some people use BANT. It could be MedPick, whatever. But you need to have a process for qualifying your deals. Now, if you do something highly transactional, maybe you don't need to as much. Or maybe as much as people hate BANT and kind of poop all over BANT on social media, if you have a highly transactional sell with like a two-week sales cycle, BANT's not that bad as a criteria qualification criteria. So I don't care which one you pick. You need to pick one and you need to pick the one that's most relevant based on what your sales process and stages look like and follow it. The problem is most sellers don't follow it. So frontline managers, sales leaders, founders, whoever is leading the sales team needs to be diligent in making sure that they are, that it is a hard rule that those things need to be followed and updated in the CRM. Because if that's not happening, then everything's broken and it all falls apart and nothing works. So that's number one, making sure that you have that 
understanding what a good customer looks like and then building out that criteria and then making sure that it's followed throughout the sales process. And so if you do that, and then you have good exit criteria, meaning what gets a deal from stage one to stage two? Well, this needs to happen, right? We need to quantify the pain or we need to know who the economic buyer is to get from two to three. Like whatever the case is, have all of that mapped out. So it's not something that is questioned or unsure in your sales process. So building that out, defining it, mapping it out in whatever CRM that you use and making sure that it's followed. And to, I mentioned we close it at 87%, but What I didn't say is we also disqualify 62% of our deals. So more than half of the people that we have a discovery call with, we disqualify early. So disqualifying is very important to increasing win rate and disqualifying early because if you're not disqualifying early, then that means your sellers are spending way too much time with people that are never going to close or never even become opportunities. Just a quick reminder, and then we will be right back to the show. At Revenue Insights, our goal is to share how top-performing revenue leaders build predictable, efficient, go-to-market teams. Every week, we speak to the brightest minds, and every quarter, we release the latest findings from our analysis of billions of dollars in pipeline. If you don't want to miss out, sign up to our newsletter at ebster.com forward slash newsletter dash sign up. That's ebster.com forward slash newsletter dash sign up. The link to make that a little bit easier for you will be in the show notes of this episode wherever you're listening. See you there. How does that, what's coming up for me is in, as you talk about it, it makes a lot of sense. You know, for a seller, it's well, all I'm getting through then are high quality discovery calls, like opportunities coming through to me. So I'm spending my time on people that are, or prospects that are very high quality. I would imagine that there's a transitionary stage in between, correct me if I'm wrong, where you really need to get your AEs on board with that. Is that fair to say in terms of, because initially the volume I would expect goes down with a view to it's a transition towards quality overtaking quantity and time. Absolutely. I mean, you hit the nail on the head because the problem is everybody thinks we need more leads. No, Yeah. you don't. You don't need more leads. You need the right leads. And to increase your win rate, like it, a lot of times it means saying no more often. Look, the top sellers, if you talk to the top sellers, I'm talking about the people that make million plus dollars as sellers, as individual contributors. They respect their time and they're highly disciplined with their pipeline. They don't let junk in there. It's the middle of the road salesperson that puts all this stuff in their pipe that they know is like, oh, you know, I'm trying to hit my pipeline quota. And that's why people are closing between 20, 30%. Because frankly, probably if we were to look at it, 50% of it should have never been in there in the first place. It's uh, being busy for the sake of being busy, right? Oh, yeah, it drives me nuts. It was clients, how do you manage that transitionary period? Because I assume you're going to come up against perhaps conflict with certain sellers that are like, no, I don't believe in this approach. This is absolute nonsense, blah, blah, blah. I don't have time for them then. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, hey, if you want to keep doing things the way that you're doing them, cool. If And to be fair, look, if winning 20% of the time is something that you're okay with as a sales organization and that's working, and then so be it. You do you. But if you want to win more than you lose, there's a better way to do things. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Penultimate question. I just wanted to ask, because everything, everything you said on qualification makes total sense to me as a marketer. I love it when people say it's not about more leads. What would you say about your approach and Ledium's approach to disqualifying deals that is perhaps unique compared to how a lot of businesses approach it? I mean, it's difficult because I think most of your listeners are like tech and SaaS, right? Which is those are our customers, right? But we're not a tech and SaaS. We're a service business. So how we do things could vary and be a little bit different than how a tech or SaaS company would manage things. But ultimately, it comes down to one very simple thing. Know who you serve best and build it around that. Build your qualification and disqualification criteria around that. Who are your best customers, right? Like, If we talk, you know, you talked about the 80-20 rule, right? Focus on more of the 80%. Forget the other 20. 
And if, and depending on the size of your team, like, you know, there might be people who, yeah, could you sell them? Could you help them? Yeah. But are they going to churn out after three or six months? Are they going to be a royal pain in the you know what? I mean, those are all things that you got to look at. It's not just about who can we close revenue with, who has the highest ACV, who has the highest lifetime value, if we look at everything, all things considered, who's taking the least amount of resources to service. Like these are all factors that need to be considered when identifying who is our best customer and how do we get more like that? Absolutely. Colin, very final question. What is one book that you would recommend to other revenue leaders? Yeah. So I mentioned Andy Paul. I'm going to plug his book, Sell Without Selling Out. It's a great book. Highly recommend it. Not sure if you guys have had him on the podcast yet, but if not, you should. Not yet. Let's get it done. Yeah. Beautiful. Colin, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Thanks so much for coming on and sharing your insights. I'll put a link down to Andy's book in the show notes below. But just before we go, for anyone listening that perhaps has any questions, wants to connect, follow all the good stuff that you're doing, where can they find you? Best places, look, I mean, number one, it takes a lot of hard work to put on a good quality podcast like this. So make sure that you write a review for this show. Make sure that you share it with your friends. That's the best way you can show your gratitude to Lee and the team over there. And then if you absolutely love podcasts, you can check out Sales Transformation. We drop pretty much almost daily content on there. And that's the best place to find the podcast, find out anything about me, Ledium, newsletter, you name it. Beautiful. Well, thank you for the shout out. And I'll be sure to uh, put a link down to all of that in the show notes below. Colin, thank you so much again for your time and for everyone that's listened this week. We'll catch you soon. Thanks for listening to Revenue Insights. If you want to learn more, subscribe to our newsletter and we'll deliver every episode straight to your inbox. If you have any questions, feel free to connect with us on LinkedIn. Our links will be in the episode notes. See you next week.